Thank you for listening to this forum podcast. Please check out our website for a rich archive of podcasts and writing from contemporary philosophers and other researchers on a wide variety of topics. The Forum is an educational charity dedicated to bringing academic philosophy to a broader audience. Please consider donating to us via our Just Giving page, which you can find on our website. Happy listening. Can you hear okay? You can hear at the back? Oh, a little bit. Is it okay? Well, I'll try to project, and will you signal if you find it difficult? Um, Otherwise, you'll be alone (laughs) in the back of the audience. Oh, my God, the puns are starting already. Um, I'm Shahida Bari. I'm one of the fellows of the forum. Um, Welcome to this forum event titled Being Alone. Now, Jean-Paul Sartre famously observed that hell is other people. Um, But that strikes me as a rather impolite way to welcome a crowd. Um, So how about this instead from the great American writer John Steinbeck? All great and precious things are lonely. Nice, that, huh? Um, the rehabilitation of loneliness might be one of our themes tonight, um, but we might ask things like, what exactly constitutes loneliness? How possible is it to be lonely in a technological age? Or conversely, are we at our very loneliest, um, precisely because we are in a globalised and digital world? And what are the distinctions between loneliness, solitude and being alone? Now, in one regard, the very staging of this event counters that cliched image of the intellectual immersed in solitudinous reflection. We've dragged these poor folk away from their books and ivory towers. But is it possible to be lonely in a crowd? Or is the opportunity to be lonely a privilege not afforded to many of us? So joining us to discuss are James Warren. James is a professor of ancient philosophy from the Classics Faculty at the University of Cambridge, and his work has largely been on Epicurus, Epicureanism, and Democritian ethics. Barbara Taylor is a professor of humanities in the School of History and English at Queen Mary University of London. She's an intellectual and cultural historian, and she's currently researching attitudes to solitude in Enlightenment Britain. And John Burnside is a writer, essayist, and professor of creative writing at St Andrews. He's the winner of both the T.S. Eliot and Forward Prizes for Poetry. Interestingly, John, I noticed that Wikipedia says that your work, is immer- uh, your work involves you being immersed in ecology, which makes you sound a little bit like Rousseau when he gets fed up of the crowd and goes to talk to the bluebells. So we'll see what happens. Now, most of you know the formats of these events. I'll ask the questions, and I'll invite our panellists to speak to each other on the subject of solitude, (laughs) loneliness, and being alone. And I'll encourage them to talk with each other. But we will open up to the floor as soon as possible. So, James, you're up first. Are we mistaken to imagine philosophy particularly as a solitary activity? And how have classical thinkers, uh, have classical philosophers thought about solitude? Um, yes, is the short answer that f- philosophy isn't, and I don't think ever really was properly uh, conceived of as a, as a solitary activity, at least in the following way um, that, um, insofar as philosophy is a kind of inquiry, I think it's best understood as uh, a collaborative exercise often, and um, even those philosophers who, like Aristotle or Plato, also tended to value the idea of the philosopher as a knower, um, they saw a great value in the stage of inquiry of philosophy, in dialogue. I mean, there's a reason why Plato writes works in the form he does, because he thinks of the way in which we come to understand things, first of all, as a kind of conversation. And a conversation is had between at least two parties, whether on a page or in person. That, it's worth distinguishing that stage from the stage of someone who's attained a kind of understanding already and has some kind of synoptic grasp of a body of knowledge. That's something that you can retain and actively contemplate all by yourself. Um, so there is also in Plato and Aristotle the theme of the self-sufficient knower as someone who can contemplate the forms or engage in a kind of contemplative activity. But what's interesting, I think, is that they tend to think of that not just as the best kind of intellectual activity, but it's almost a superhuman kind of intellectual activity. It's a divine kind of activity. So once again, I think it shows that for them, 
there's something uh, essentially social about human activity as such, even if the human activity is something like philosophy. So when you say divine, do you mean that to engage in solitudinous philosophical reflection is to imitate a god? Yes. Yes. And so, uh, so who are you thinking of particularly? Who are the examples that... Well, Aristotle that? says that, for example. Aristotle, at the end of the ethics, he spent all this time telling you how to be a virtuous person and he'll spend even longer in the politics telling you about how uh, humans are essentially social creatures. And I, perhaps we should say something about that in a minute. But when he, he describes what the very best kind of thing a human can do might be, it's a self-sufficient activity of contemplation. It's the active going over already acquired truths. And that's something you don't need someone else to help you do. It's something God does because God will always be self-sufficient and will never need someone else to help, help it along. Great. Um, Barbara, jo- John, I wondered if you had any responses to that. I was just curious, I mean, um, in, I, I'm not a classicist at all, but if I understand um, Plato's model of philosophical thinking, it's very much a sort of dialogic yeah. one. I think you indicated that. Um, and as a, as a sort of model of thinking, that seems fascinating. And we might want to think more about the implications of it for solitude or in general. But I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. Um, good, yes. So I think... The way in which he conceives of thinking is, um, I think you could call it dialogic, or Mm. uh, um, it's conversational, we might say. Um, And so that's why when he writes a philosophical work, often it's a conversation between distinct persons, and the philosophy happens in the conversation between them. Mm. Um, Now, he also, um, well, Socrates says, at least in certain Plato's works, when Socrates describes what it is to do a bit of thinking, sometimes he will describe that as a kind of internal conversation. Mm. So even if you're sitting alone pondering a question, there's a tendency to think of that as a sort of internal discussion where you Mm. you have to split yourself into two kind of imagined um, members of a conversation and and see how Mm. how they work it out. So even if you're doing it all by yourself... It's a, it, there's a plurality to it. There's mm. at least a partnership of, of points of view going on. But what happens to ethics, then? If philosophy is a solitary engagement and a kind of imitation of the divine, where does ethics come into it? Because ethics surely is that moment of the intersection of the, sol- the solitude and philosophy with Well, that else. brings us back to um, another thing that Aristotle says is quite clear, which is that uh, humans are essentially social creatures. I mean, that's probably the best way to understand his famous tag that man is a political animal. That doesn't mean man goes out and campaigns (laughs) for office. It means, actually, he says that that means that if you're really to live a human life, you have to live a human life within a polis, within a Greek city-state. You have to be engaged with other members of that city-state. You have to be playing your part as a citizen. You have to be dealing with other people and so on. And I think there's a a real truth to that. And actually, I think that might be an important key to why loneliness might be generally thought to be a mark of a certain kind of deficiency or a mark of a lack or something, because it's an absence of something that's essential for living a full and flourishing human life. And it's a painful and uh, unwanted absence of that kind of activity, that kind of interpersonal activity that is a marker of us as the kinds of animals we are. Yeah, I think we, we, we're going to uh, probe that question about whether loneliness is about a lack or being alone is about missing something mm. or whether it is a, a more kind of self-sufficient state or a, a kind of um, accomplished state. Um, uh, but, uh, John, was there anything you wanted to add to the conversation before I move on to Barbara? I was... <coughs> sorry, I'm not going to um, I was thinking about... Um, what making a distinction between the different terminology you were using as you were speaking, talking about contemplation, uh, philosophizing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, because, for example, Thomas Merton says that um, when he is engaged in, in contemplation, he is actually benefiting the, 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 the body, the pu- public, that he'll never meet because he's a solitary contemplative. But 
his solitary contemplation actually benefits the polis without him being actually actively involved in the polis. So there is this aspect of um, solitary, as well, the word is probably best to use as contemplation. But in, in, do the Greeks make, I don't know enough or don't remember enough, make significant distinctions between the act of contemplation, for example, and other kinds of um, more perhaps um, social thinking or collaborative thinking. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, th- there's a terminology that you might associate with it. What I'm using the word contemplation to mark is what Aristotle calls theoria. You know, we have a kind of theory comes from that, but it's actually from a Greek word uh, to do with viewing something. It's the same kind of root that theatre and these kinds of things come from. And it's, it's having something in view and you casting your eye over it. So it's not acquiring it, it's there already and you're just, as it were, actively once again looking at it. That's, that's the sense of contemplation I had in, in mind there. As to whether it benefits society at large, well, if you think there's a value to people knowing things, then I suppose that's true. Yeah, I guess we're using... When we start using the word contemplation, say, after the transcendentalists, say, um, or any influence from Eastern um, philosophy, contemplation becomes something different then, doesn't it? I think of it as, as being similar to what Keats talks about when he talks about seeing the subject as subject as opposed to object in one of his letters, that the poetic endeavour is to engage the other as subject, as opposed to you know, the scientific sense of object, objectifying something. And um, contemplation is to do that. And I think probably the romantics and the transcendentalists, and this is where the, where, the, where the turn happens, maybe the pivoting point happens, with the romantics and transcendentalists, is they begin to say that other people get in the way of your full appreciation of the subject that you're trying to contemplate. Because society, society, social norms and the present, mere presence of others gets in the way somehow of that process, which I don't think the Greeks have at all. <clears throat> um, well, Aristotle wonders that you need to have uh, what I suppose we'd call leisure to do this kind of thing. So it's better, and of course he's the kind of guy who doesn't need to go to work for a living, um, and most of his chums weren't doing this either, that your slave brings you your dinner and off you go to the Lyceum for the afternoon. Um, so it's quite important to have scholar, to have this kind of leisure time so you're not required to do menial tasks just, just to stay alive. And then you're the kind of Aristo that can do a bit of excellent philosophising like that. But is it not also... I, I, I was just um, uh, reading in, in Aristotle where he also says, when I say self-sufficient... I don't actually mean isolated. I can't remember no, in the ethics. No, no, he says, no, yeah, you know, you can, you, you, with your, I mean, and of course, Odium, you, you, in leisure, you're with your, your family, your intimates, your servants, and so on. So it's a, I think we need to be careful about terms like self-sufficient yeah. or alone and, uh, you know, what, what was actually meant by them. Um, and, I mean, not just in antiquity, but up until the very recent past, which usually meant being surrounded by those close to you, those part That's of your right. family in some sense. So. Right, so there's, there's a strand of thinking that says um, because we're not, as it were, practically self-sufficient, that's why we need other people and we need to spend time with other people, that we can't do everything for ourselves. So there are, there's a strand of thinking that that's why humans first got together in groups. So there are ancient stories that work like that that say, well, some guy was really good at building houses, but he was terrible as a farmer. So he had to get to know the guy who could grow crops, and he says, I'll build your house if you make me my dinner, and this kind of thing. This is how we get together and, and form um, sufficient kind of ways of, of meeting all of our individual needs through collective enterprise. One last question is before I throw Barbara into the mix. Um, I wonder if, isn't this account of the Greeks too neat? To my mind, it seems neat that you have a kind of peaceful, a peaceable solitude where you can think and work, and then you go and join the symposium, and it's rowdy, and there's lots of booze, and you have a good time. But there's a very clean division. But isn't the, is, are, can you think of examples, or is, there, is, is it the case that the solitary 
Doesn't the solitary philosopher also feel lonely sometimes? I'm trying to make a distinction here between loneliness yes, and yeah, solitude. Yeah, yeah. A kind no, of scholarly sp- solitude. Um, he does, Aristotle does worry about this because he, at one point he gets worried that the picture he's painting of the excellent philosopher is going to look unattractive because it looks like, he says, well, is, the, is this person going to have friends? He's really, he's really insistent. Academics ask that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> he's really insistent that a good life must involve friendship and he spends a fifth of the ethics talking about friendship. It's two books out of ten, so it's absolutely essential to mm. what he has to say. And he comes up with a, a, quite a sort of, I don't know, well, it might be a dodge. Anyway, the, the subtle answer he offers is um, the, the excellent person won't need friends, but, of course, will have friends because he's so excellent, and his friends will also be excellent, and they will uh, enjoy one another as if they're other selves. So that, that's... You know, when, when his excellent friend does something, it's as if he does it himself. I'm so glad Aristotle got the work-life balance right. <laughs> um, Barbara, let's get you in. Well, um, can I just say, Dov, yes. also, I mean, it, it depends on... I mean, it, if we look across other philosophical schools, of course, I mean, we, we get many other points of view on this, and, and the emphasis on what, um, you know, being anachronistic we could call loneliness, I mean, comes up. In Stoicism, for example, I mean, but but even but even Aristotle, I mean, I was somewhere says um, that isn't it extraordinary how philosophers and poets and so on all seem to suffer from um, an excess of black bile, by which he means they suffer from melancholy, which we're I'm sure going to revisit, or it, it, or at least it's very common among um, people, and and the link between um, solitude of any variety and melancholy. Um, is is such a powerful one throughout. So, I think I think I, I would I would emphasize some real tensions. I think um, in um, uh, in in ancient thought around these questions, um, you know, that that um, then keep recurring um, in later forms of humanism. And so, well, let's revisit that. I think that's an mm. important point. Um, and connected to whether loneliness can be a performance or a posture as well, I think. Oh, well. Melancholia. Yeah. But um, we're getting ahead of ourselves. You, just, you did just say that loneliness is an anachronistic term in the sense that we're using it in yes. our conversation. Um, and I want to ask you about that, because uh, this last week the government appointed a minister for loneliness um, in response to the findings of the Joe Cox Commission about, I think, increasing social atomization. But is loneliness a modern epidemic? Can you give, it, give us some of the history? Um, well, uh, if I can just talk about the word for a minute, because, um, I mean, actually looking at, and I'm talking about English language now um, only, um, I mean, it's actually, I think, uh, you know, looking at the sort of lexical history of these terms is actually quite revealing. So loneliness, um, as far as I only really comes into widespread usage in the, in the 19th century. Now, this is not to say that people didn't experience forms. I mean, if we think about the distinction between being alone, which obviously you can experience in a multitude of ways, and something that we think of now as loneliness, which is a painful way of being alone. I mean, what kind of pain that is, is actually, interestingly, I think, very difficult for people to describe. And I've been sort of looking at attempts on people's, you know, for people to have to, to describe the feelings that, they want to call loneliness, and we might want to discuss that. But at any rate, certainly long before you get um, common usage of the term loneliness, people have a painful experience of being alone. I mean, if you think of poor old Robinson Crusoe up there on the Caribbean island, you know, tortured by his um, sense of isolation, um, or if we return to, to, to the ancients, I mean, I mean, Cicero says that anyone... Um, who is completely alone for any length of time is going to die. And that's, what's really interesting is that this is then quoted by some of the very famous solitaries of later centuries, including um, Petrarch and Montaigne, both quote Cicero on this. So the idea that, that, um, you know, that loneliness in that sense is, is, is a kind of impossible, intolerable condition is very much part of Western culture. The term that people use rather than loneliness is solitude or solitariness. And, um, and I think what's really striking about, I mean, here I'm 
<laughs> I'm, I'm starting to be speculative because there's actually remarkably little historical work has been done on the story of um, the long history of solitude. But um, when people use it, um, certainly in what we can really loosely call pre-modern, um, so let's say before the uh, 18th century, when they used um, solitude or solitariness, they mean something very loosely, more like the way we talk about private life now. Um, I mean, that's not quite accurate, but it'll do for the moment, because when we talk about private life, we do think of it as including um, family, friends, lovers, and so on. Um, we don't think of it as, a, as, as an isolated state, necessarily. Um, and this was very important to the way that people talked and thought about solitude, was that, by and large, it was seen as a relational and communicative state, where the solitary person, um, by virtue of being outside a public arena, outside of polis or so on, was able to connect up in, in sort of more intimate and powerful ways with friends, with lovers, um, with memories, uh, and so on. Um, and crucially, uh, and this is something we, we will want to talk about, to the divine, um, to God or gods, um, solitude has a religious, powerful religious framework um, throughout the whole of, um, of Western history, right up till the very recent past. And anyone who doesn't have some, this kind of form of connectedness, um, whether to, 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 you know, to intimates, to friends, and so on, or in communion with the divine, um, and, this, and, and having a lack of such connectedness can happen even in social settings. Famously, Milton, in an unhappy marriage, or the anonymity of a crowded city, or whatever. But if you find yourself feeling disconnected, then you're in big trouble. And this is where we have the beginnings, if you like, the, the origins of the idea of loneliness, I think, is this solitariness in that sense, where there is a lack of that form of connection, um, is actually seen as very dangerous, and it's associated with a whole um, host of miseries which usually come under the rubric of melancholy, um, but also, I mean, other sorts of perils. Um, for example, and this is not just a side issue, um, solitude made people very vulnerable to the devil, and that's a very big theme in the history of solitude. Um, and is that a euphemism? But if you're, I mean, by if you're alone, what will you get up to? Is that what the suspicion is? No, it's that the devil the, the will come devil. and get you. Right. No, no. I mean, Just checking. I mean, yes. There's also this is a whole other area of conversation. <laughs> there's what you will get up to yeah. when you're alone, and that's um, and uh, a masturbation is a really big theme in um, anti-solitude yes. literature. It's a, 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 a predominant theme. It comes under various euphemisms, although not necessarily very euphemistic. <laughs> but no, the devil waits the devil. for yeah. people um, in solitude. Yeah. And your ur case, of course, is Eve wanders off from Adam in, um, in a, a dangerous independency, as one writer calls it, and the serpent um, gets her. And Adam and Eve are, in fact, the first, the first solitaries. They have each other, but they're exiled. And the relationship between exile and solitude is very important. And most importantly, they are cut off from God's grace. And that separation between man and God is a very important moment in, um, in loneliness. So long before we've got a language of loneliness, solitude can be a really lonely um, business. And um, I mean, then I do think, and I'm not going to, say more about this now because we're going to want to talk about this. I do think that there's a, a whole series of really significant changes that probably from the Reformation onward um, that um, and um, but you know there, there are some rather glib ways that I think this has been talked about. I mean particularly the rise of individualism which I think is quite a problematic um, I mean we might want to explore that a bit but there's certainly there's certainly some, a set of circumstances, historical circumstances, which has brought us to the point that we are at today, which I think most of us can agree is, is one where you know, the problem may not be quite the way in which Theresa May or 
wants to address it, but that there is a problem right now about loneliness. I think we can agree. Yes, I think we're certainly going to talk about that. I just want to ask about the real devil. Um, uh, cause, uh, just because so the, we've established in, the, in this particular historical moment the devil is real, but it, is, the God, is God real too in those moments? If being alone is about realizing God or being in an engagement, a particular kind of engagement with God, in the material that you've read, is it also a querying of God? Do, do the people who are alone, do they find that they are alone and not with God? Yes, they can, and that is a terrible experience. I mean, um, the, I mean the, the, one of the great terms for loneliness is forsaken. Wow, yes. Um, and, um, and, the, um, and there's a rich poetry. Um, I mean, any of you who are familiar with the work of the, of the poet William Cooper... Um, will will know. I mean, the, the heart wrenching account of being forsaken by God, or um, you know, the the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Uh, Coleridge's great poem tells you the story of um, you know of of, of uh, uh, also an experience of being forsaken by by God after the commission of a terrible sin. Um, so. And there, uh, but if you want, <laughs> if you want the full dramatization of the encounter between God and the devil in solitude, then you need to read John Bunyan's *Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners*, where they alone, Bunyan, they is becomes a battleground between God and Satan, and it, it throws him around the room. I mean, this, and this is what I mean. You know, many, many people experience solitude as this kind of spiritual battleground. Um, and the, the vividness of, of Bunyan's um, uh, uh, evocation of that is extraordinary. But I think it does reflect uh, wider religious experiences that people... And absolutely, I mean, the sense of, of the presence of the devil. Um, I mean, Martin Luther has extraordinary accounts of battling, warring, with the devil. And there's always the question of, is, is God sufficiently on your side? I mean, you know. And, um, and of course, with some varieties of Protestantism, that was a real issue because if you had already been predestined to be damned, well, maybe not, you know. So. Yeah. That's wonderfully evocative and terrifying, I think. <laughs> um, uh, James and John, can I invite you to respond to Barbara? Did you have thoughts? I had one thought about, I mean, obviously it's, it's, um, it's not going to it's going to jump the gun again. Um, obviously, when we get to the stage in industrial life where the division of labor becomes an important aspect of social structures, then, then we're breaking down working together. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that ties into something larger, which, um, and I'm coming at this from the completely opposite side from, I think, both of you are, because I'm coming from the other side of transcendentalism, um, where, in fact, solitude is this, you can't get enough of it, you know, it's just wonderful. Because, of course, of the Industrial Revolution. Industrial Revolution takes everything, every aspect of human life, and, 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 and bastardizes it, um, you know, de denatures it, denatures the land, denatures the way in which you work together, with the enclosures, with acts of enclosure, you have the people that are deprived of the land that they worked, so that they become, a, you know, a kind of just a proletariat fodder for um, the machinery of, the, of capitalism. Um, and that is when, of course, you have people wanting to be alone because society is going so badly wrong, generally, because of industrialization, because of, kind of runaway capitalism in the 19th century. Um, you don't want to be part of the problem. You don't want to be involved in this system, which is so destructive. It's destroying everything that you hold dear. So, of course, for the transcendentalists and some of the romantics, the danger wasn't of um, how bad it was, to, how dangerous it might be to be alone, because the devil wasn't there, and God probably wasn't either, it was nature. But the danger was that you would love it so much that you'd never want to come back. <laughs> and um, you had to constantly remind yourself that it is a human being's social obligation to return to the human fold, no matter how corrupt it's become, and fight for, for example, in the case of Emerson and Thoreau, fight for, against slavery, for example. Mm, mm. So, I mean, I mean, I think Thoreau, it's interesting talking about you know, getting people to do things for you. Thoreau did everything for himself badly, but at least he managed to cope. 
But I think Thoreau would have happily stayed in some kind of isolated condition for the rest of his life. And at the end, when he's at Cape Cod, for example, in the end of his life, he wants to turn his back on America. He wants to be as far away from America as he possibly can. So he's standing at Cape Cod with his back to all of America because America has become this awful, corrupted nightmare rather than a dream. Um, so I think that I think one relates that to things like the, the, the breakdown in working together that comes after division of labour. I did predict your Rousseau and running off to talk to the bees earlier on in the introduction, but I think that there's a question there about is that is is there a moment in your history, Barbara, where we become comfortable with being alone? John seems to be saying it's industrialisation, or we want we seek to be alone. Well, people sought to be alone. Um, but not scared throughout. of being alone. Well, but, uh, no, because I mean, I mean the um, the conditions of higher knowledge um, were seen to be solitary, and um, uh, and this persists. I mean, so that um, uh, with qualifications and tensions and so on. So um, the um, I mean when. You know, when James was speaking about the philosopher being, in some sense, philo the philosophical contemplative being aligned to the divine, and in that sense being perhaps an impossibility for ordinary humans. I mean, I think Aristotle, is not, it's not entirely clear whether this is actually a possible figure or not, but, but, um, but nonetheless, I mean, this, 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 you know, the, the, that figure then becomes, in a sense, the religious contemplative of the Christian tradition. I mean, who is also engaged in a lot of intellectual activities, not just swooning over God, you know, um, and is having a, and is also involved in conversational relationship with God and angels and so on and so forth. So, and people people seek forms of solitude in order to have these higher experiences and. One of the things about, about, about the Reformation, about Protestantism, is, of course, that then um, you don't have the church as an institution as, as, as such a powerful mediator in, um, in the spiritual relationship, so it becomes more of a, a, a privatized um, experience. So, so I think this is an ongoing... Um, I mean, I think we need to be careful about what sorts of people could find such situations. Um, and, um, and take up again James's point about leisure and um, you know who who had the time and wherewithal for this um, also in relation to transcendentalism and so on but um, so um, I think there is a there is a shift I mean I I, I, I agree with John I think that there's um, the um, there's a a way in which the, the way that what you achieve, the solitude as an achieved state, um, what you achieve in it, um, particularly in relation to the, the natural world becoming a kind of, uh, in a way, uh, uh, sacralized. I mean, the natural world becoming uh, experienced in solitude, becoming where you are sort of in touch with with the sacred, with the numinous in some sense. And I think, and, um, and that happens in the 18th century and gives a, um, and I mean, the key figure is probably Rousseau, but there are others as well um, who, who, who offer that kind of vision of solitude. But even Rousseau said that actually no one can really be happy alone. <laughs> you need other yeah. people. You need an engaged heart, you know. Yeah. I mean, there, I don't think there's anyone who unequivocally, I mean, I, I defer to you, uh, Thoreau <laughs> and Emerson, but, um, but the sense <coughs> that, that, you know, that, that to enjoy solitude, you need to feel that there is somebody there in some you. sense for you, I think, persists mm -hmm. throughout the whole. And if there isn't, you're really in trouble. Yeah. Well, we'll ask our audience that in a moment, <laughs> I think. Just, just one last question. Just, I, was just, I just remembered that you, stu you prefaced your thoughts with Crusoe, with the example of Crusoe being alone. And then, of course, Crusoe isn't alone. Friday's on the island. And I wondered whether... Maybe this is coming back to this question that I posed earlier about loneliness or solitude as a posture. 
and the fantasy or the fiction of solitude, is it predicated on the willful oblivion, the willful neg neglect of other people? Is it a kind of fiction? And are we instead, because Crusoe ultimately is obliged to form a social bond with Friday. And are we... Well, I mean, the, the bewailings of his, cir his circumstances happen before he meets Friday. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, he's very grateful, in fact, I mean, he, you know, that, that he has made this, um, you know, this problematic encounter. But in fact, long before that happens, the, 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 the climactic is, is also when, um, in fact, in solitude, he encounters God. And, um, and he then said, ah, providence, you know, he's a good Puritan. Providence has brought me here so that I would find what was there all the time. Um, and, and, of course, that's what the encounter with God is. Actually, you've never been alone. He's always been there is the idea. I mean, Augustine's confessions, you know, when Augustine goes into solitude, it's in order to find what is already there inside him. He makes this extraordinary inward journey into my inner citadel, and God is waiting for him. So, um, so that's the, the way that, and that, that's the, the, the great value that's placed on solitude is, is that, that experience. The inward res a resource yeah. that you have to So have. then there's a question of what happens if God isn't there, and I think that's a really important question in the yes. history of solitude. Yeah, we're gonna get to that, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's get to John. Um, John, I was going to ask, I was going to ask you how, uh, I was going to point out that writers usually write on their own, but to and for an audience. And I was going to ask you how far do writers think of themselves as solitary creatures. But listening to this conversation, I much more want to know how far you think of yourself as a solitary creature, as a, as a writer. Well, I'm glad you said that, because, because I can't speak for other writers. Because... <laughs> um, um, I dislike other writers as much as I dislike other people generally. He has it here first. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, let's see. <laughs> no, I, I have a very uh, fond regard for the human race generally, um, as long as they stay away from me. Um, no, it, it is true for me anyway. It is true that I remember reading the, the book, uh, Anthony Storr's book, The School of Genius, it was called. It was called something else as well, but it was called The School of Genius. And it's about how lonely people are, or solitary people, make works of genius. Mm -hmm. and I thought, great, because I was a solitary person. I hadn't done anything of a genius, of course. But I thought, well, one of these days, genius is sure to come if I stay alone for long enough. So I've remained as obnoxious as possible for as long as possible. But so far, genius waits somewhere in the wings. Um, but it is true that um, to work, I have to be alone. And I mean, I don't mean alone as in there's someone in the next room you know, making tea, I have to be alone, um, you know, and, and preferably in my own canton in Switzerland, you know. Gosh, is that me doing that? Someone very angry. <laughs> but, you know, someone in the house, and I know there's someone else in the house, for example. If I'm more trying to work and someone else is in the house, I can't work. You know, so I built a shed in the garden, but I live in Scotland, so as you can imagine, I don't get much work done that way either. But I was, I, I am interested in the point at which that became an, an image of the writer as a solitary. Um, we don't think of Dr. Johnson, for example, as being a particularly solitary, loving kind of character. No. Um, but I think it's partly, it's, it's, for me anyway, it's partly the influence of Eastern thought coming into um, the West um, and in, in the late 18th and 19th century. And we, we did sort of cherry pick the kind of poems and songs we liked. Um, but if you look at um, St. Marla's uh, Dasi Fonta Erda, for example, all of the poems that he's chosen from the Chinese tradition have got solitude in them and all about lonely people or solitary people. And when they are, he puts new lines in to indicate that, <laughs> you know, because he wants, he has this image of the, the, the lonely wife, for example, whose husband is away in, on the border wall, or the lonely official who misses his friend, and so he's drinking a cup of wine under the moon, celebrating his friend who's many, many miles away. And that seems to be rather an attractive pose, which um, was adopted in the West, for sure. But um, I do believe that there was a point, a point came when many people who were writers were writing about 
for trying to write a world which was better than the world they lived in. I don't think many of them are seriously believed in God. I don't think, I mean, I don't think Emerson really believed in God in, in, in the usual sense of the word, and certainly Thoreau didn't. But um, they believed in something there, um, and we call it nature, I suppose, but it doesn't really help very much. But I think that the, the people like that were, were saying, things are wrong here. In the social sphere, things are wrong. I have to go outside and be outside that to see what's really truthful, what really is the truth about life. And alongside solitude always comes, and transcendentalism, and it always comes self-reliance. We always, I mean, you know, if anybody writes a nasty on solitude, they also write about self-reliance. Everyone does it. Because they say you have to be self-reliant. You have to be able to step outside the social circle and, 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 and survive emotionally, physically, intellectually, etc., by yourself. So that's, and, and most writers, when they, most of the people who are influenced by transcendentalism, when they get outside the social circle, enjoy it. They like to be there. As I say, they have to remind themselves that you have a duty to come back, you know? But who, who, could, who, could, who could say that Walt Women is absolutely happy when he sings himself, you know? Walt Women is constantly wandering around the world thinking, isn't it great to be me, <laughs> you know? And he's not caring, he doesn't care about other people. Um, he likes them all, he, he likes to look at them, especially the young men. But, um, you know, they can be there or not. It's, it's the fact that he's there as witness that matters. It, it's not misanthropy, it's a sort of... Not in the least. ...self-sufficient, no. a kind of perfect contentment with oneself. But I want to... But this, maybe this question about being perfectly content with oneself, that's what I want to press. Do you have a dog, for instance? No. Is it cheating if you <laughs> are alone with a dog? Because I'm wondering whether when you say you can't have anybody else in the house when you're writing, whether it's about simply blocking out noise and the debris of other people's lives or other animals, or whether it's about an opportunity... Being alone is a chance to be the only chance you have to be absolutely yourself. Is that what we're saying that happens when you're alone? I think uh, this, is, this is one of my crazier theories. I'm going to write it out one day and be <laughs> fully outcast from society. I believe that many, many people who worked in that kind of school, solitary genius, suffer from the same condition I do, I do which is called hyperacusis. It's a, it's a, a medically... Um, described, fully described condition, and it's extreme sensitivity to certain noises. Oh. And um, many more people have it, they know that my doctor, who's a specialist in this, he himself, was, uh, himself says around about 10% of the population have some kind of problem which influ influences their social life or their thinking related to hearing. Mm -hmm. In my case, it's, yeah. it's a very extreme reaction to certain noises such that I will literally leave a spot, I will actually move Abset myself in the place of certain noises are happening, one of them being a dog barking. So, so no, I don't have a dog. Yeah. My not children have three cats. I try to pretend they're not there. <laughs> but um, they're not very noisy. But I think noise is a very important thing. Again, with the Industrial Revolution, the world gets yes. much noisier and dirtier and uglier. And so, of course, all of these things, imagine you don't know it because it's, it's the whole society you live in Poo poos the idea that you actually may be suffering because you can hear certain kinds of noises. Mm. I mean, my father would have slapped me on the head and said, I'll grow up, boy. You know? But imagine if that's the case. Mm. That's, you know? that's terribly interesting because we, we have been talking about solitude and aloneness in quite abstract ways, but here we're talking about it as a sensory experience. It's about mm. the exclusion of certain things. But it did make me think of John Cage locking himself in the, that soundproof box and then being f irritated to hear the sound of his own blood, pre his blood and mm. a kind of, it was a high-pitched noise that was his own nervous system. Yeah. So my <laughs> question then is, are we ever really alone when we are alone, even just with ourselves? Well, uh, we all make noises. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I, I, I do remember that feeling of being walking alone in, say, the high Arctic, where you can hear everything in your body happening. Yeah. But you get kind of get used to it. But then there's, there's a sound, I don't know, I've never been able to explain it away. <laughs> there is a sound, if you go walking in the Fidmarks in northern Norway, there's a sound you can hear, and it isn't coming from your body, 
And it's not come from anything around me that I can think of as rational. And my Sami friend says it's the sound of the earth, whatever that is. You know, but they say that, the Sami people say that the earth is actually made from the body of a two-year-old ra- male reindeer. And the, the, the hair is, the, the trees are made from the hair, and the rivers are made from the blood, etc. And um, the, 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 at the center of all, deep in the earth, there's a heart beating, of course. And my friend Harold Gasky, who's a, a Sami writer and activist, I, I remember him saying once, um, every now and again I'm tempted to put my ear to the ground and listen to hear the heart, because they say if you can hear the heart, you know, things are still okay. And I said, but do you? And he said, no, for two reasons. One is, if I put my ear to the, ear to the ground and I don't hear it, it could be because it's, it's over, the, the world is so badly messed up that it's dying, or that I'm not a real Sami, because he's an academic now, he lives outside the Sami world, some, to some extent. I'm not a real Sami anymore, so I won't. Other people can hear it, but I won't. <coughs> so he doesn't listen. But according to the old story, if, you, if you're a Sami, and then you put your head to the ground, and you hear the beating heart, it means that there's still hope. This conversation is taking unexpected but beautiful directions. <laughs> um, let's get um, Barbara and, and James in. I wondered if you had thoughts for, for John. Well... I'm, I mean, one of the themes that, that recurs throughout the history of, 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 of the ways that people have talked and written about, about solitude is about, uh, is about the imagination. And, I mean, when, when Rousseau talks about, about being alone, there's a famous scene where he's out in a boat in a lake or by himself. And, um, and it's about being inside a sort of waking dreams, um, and uh, and he, it's a um, ecstatic evocation of of uh, an efflorescence of essentially erotic fantasy, but but, um, um, but very beautifully expressed. And um, so I'm wondering, how important do you think the world of fantasy is when you're talking about these forms of, of welcome solitude? I think, I think this is the fantasy. This is the fantasy. The real world is when you get away from social society. I would prefer to use the term societal rather than social, for various reasons. But um, once you get outside the societal, once you get outside human-imposed order, then you can see the natural order. You can begin to perceive the natural order. There's a great poem by A.R. Uh, Ammons, uh, uh, Caution's Ill- Inlet. And he said, I'm going to go for a walk on a beautiful inlet in, 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 on the Jersey Shore, um, Corson's Inlet, it's a famous, the beautiful place. Hey, I'm going to walk there because, so I can get rid of all of these lines, straight lines, these you know, horizontals and, and verticals, and, and begin to see the natural order again. Mm. So that's what he's beginning with. Mm. But then, of course, it goes much further. And by the time he's halfway through the poem, he sounds like Rachel Carson. Mm. And um, it goes, for me, I, and I, again, I, I lack the historical depth, but I can go back to someone like Albertus Magnus, for example, and, have, and hear him saying, if you look at nature, mm. you see an order mm. that human order never approaches. It can, it can, it can almost, it can, it, can, it can come close, but it can never actually overlap with the, nat- with the natural order. And the natural order is always the highest order, as it were. It's almost... It's always the most perfect order. And when human beings make things, they can make things which correspond... We think of Heidegger as well on this. Make things that correspond quite closely to the natural order, and he thinks of that in terms of dwelling, and, or else that, that completely you know, trample on the natural order, which we do tend to do um, quite a lot, especially when you come to London from Scotland every now and again. You see some new atrocity being committed. Um, so, you know... Um, well, what we actually do is when we get outside the societal, mm. we can contemplate, as it were, and I don't mean this in some kind of romantic way, I don't, I don't really like the romantics very much, um, but we can actually look at and observe without fantasy. You know, Goethe's always talking about this. Don't let your fantasy get in the way of your perception. I, I only wish if we had Newton had never existed and that all our models of science had been based on Goethe. Because we'd have a much better society now. I think that makes you very romantic, actually, that <laughs> sentiment. Probably. Right. I'm beginning to, to feel a bit uncomfortable with this <laughs> extolling of this 
kind of voluntary exile. I mean, they, they well, you have to come back. You must come right. back. Well, it's, beginning, it's becoming very unattractive to me, I think, <laughs> these kind of lives. They strike me as um, deeply unusual, self-indulgent, and quite likely parasitic on other people, having, you know, kept things going while you were off... Ah, but you have to be self-reliant, too. Sorry? You have to be self-reliant, too. Doesn't Thoreau go to his mother too. for... But hang on, there, 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 is, a question, there, is, a there is a question here, and I, mm. and I can sense the audience are itching to, to get their um, pennies worth in. But there is a question here about whether being alone is a privilege, exactly mm. as Jane is saying, that, that there are other people for whom you cannot but be in the fray, in the fever and the fret of, the, of society. You have to go to work or you have well, to... Well, let me put it another way, because that sounds like it, it's, there are obligations that you may want to be free from. But it, I think it's worth also um, reminding ourselves of the benefits of being with other people. I mean, that there are genuine human activities, meaningful human activities that can't be done all by oneself and that do involve you having deep, lasting, committed uh, relationship with other people, having fleeting relationships with other people of all sorts. And there's, there's a reason why solitary confinement is a punishment for human beings. There's a reason why most animals, if you leave them on their own or cage them on their own, they go a bit crazy. Well, that's because it's confinement. It's caging that drives them crazy, not the solitary. But, 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 but if, we, if, we, if, we, if we think about our own lives, I, I may, may, this may not be true for you, John, but I would guess for most people here, really what we're talking about is, is solitude as intermittent, <laughs> as occasional, as a, as a feature of life that we all have. I mean, we don't have to choose a reclusive life in order to experience solitude, um, either welcome forms of it or unwelcome forms. So... I think some of the fascinating questions about what kind of experience is that for you know most of us most of the time now, and you know for me as a historian, I'm very curious about how that differs from the past. Occasional, intermittent, for whether voluntary or involuntary, um, and then the question of are we ever alone when we're alone, um, so to speak. I yeah. think um, we could pose in another, maybe in other sorts of ways as well, as sort of, you know, what kind of, what kind of inner life are we experiencing when we're alone? And how has contemporary society maybe changed that, maybe with, you know, being digitally connected or, you know, whatever? Well, let me ask this one last question to the entire panel before I throw it open to you guys. Um, is this a more lonely age than others? Is this a more socially atomized age than any others. And maybe, James, you're the person to ask as a, a classicist. Uh, well, I was going to say, I, I mean, I've no idea how you'd answer that question. I don't know what the metric would be or what the method of comparison would be. It's, it does seem to be that people are reporting what they call loneliness and that there are high levels of that and it seems to be associated with various other kinds of problems, including genuine health risks, that it causes physical damage. Um, that correlates with reported levels of subjective loneliness. Um, whether people before felt that way, I don't know. I mean, there are questions about whether there's a, there was a sense of privacy before the modern age and so on, which I'm not sure I would be able to um, uh, say much about, really. Um, d you know, did, a, did an ancient Greek feel lonely? I'm not sure. I'm not sure they, they had a word for it. Mm -hmm. Um, they valued personal contact and they valued friendship and so on, which strikes me as that they found something would be lacking were that not present in their lives. But did Aristotle sometimes shut a door and want not to hear, you know, the chatter of Theophrastus asking him various <laughs> boring questions? Sure he did, yeah. <laughs> Barbara? I don't know either. Um, and, um, I mean, I can think of a whole, and I'm sure other people here... Can. I can think of a whole set of um, cultural phenomena that would seem to me to point toward increasing isolation, atomization, um, and so on. Um, so, um, and I think that those are things we need to think about. We need to think about, um, you know, 
how those changes have come about and whether there's something we want to do about them and so on. Um, but I've just been reading a very interesting um, paper about um, a panic about loneliness that occurred in post-war Britain um, in the late 50s and early 1960s, where much the same sorts of things were being said as were being said today, although some of the phenomena pointed to like the rise of the suburbs and so on and so forth. So I don't know. I mean, I think that there is... I think as long as there are a lot of people who are suffering, then it's always worth asking and feel that, that there is something they call loneliness that they're suffering from. Then I think it's always a good idea to do something about human suffering um, and, uh, you know, however it labels itself. Uh, but I think there's a lot of questions to be asked about, about you know, whether loneliness is the right descriptor for this. I'm not sure. John. I think, I think obviously we go back to the making distinction between solitude and loneliness. And um, what I've been talking about mostly, I think it's probably solitude mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the sense that um, obviously when I, when I finish writing my song, if I ever do, I want to go back and find my children are still there. I don't want to find an empty house. <laughs> Um, or they will come home when dad's finished one day. But I think what we do have is a, is a, is a plague of loneliness now. But, or maybe or something is being described or being called loneliness by people who are, maybe that's the easiest handle to find. I look at it more as purposelessness. Mm -hmm. Purposelessness? Um, in the sense that I feel, you know, I meet somebody who's got 47 friends on there, or maybe more than that on there. Telephone. I don't even have one, but on my telephone anyway. Um, but they have 47 or 240 friends, and, and you can't have 240 friends. So it's not possible. Uh, but they're, they're friends on the phone. And I come to the city, and I see people on the sub, on the underground, and walking along the street. Some woman bumped into me today because she was looking at her phone, and and this couldn't be important what she was doing. It was just gossip, but whatever. But oh, Johnny, sure. Perhaps the she didn't, <laughs> she didn't really have any urgency <laughs> in her manner. But, you know, it's, the, it's filling a gap that people feel, and I think you feel it for, for various reasons. And I go back to things like working together is gone. We don't, in many cases, where people don't work together. They make components. Well, if they do even make anything anymore, they make components of something which they don't even have an overall view of, you know? Um, so... I feel this has to do with purposelessness, um, not having no sense of a bigger picture in which the, their activity fits in a meaningful way. Let's get our bigger picture in. Um, we have a road <coughs> bike. Can I see a show of hands to see how popular the conversation is going to be? <laughs> OK, so I can, I'm going to take three questions at a time. There's one at the very front. Is that a hand there too? Yeah. yeah. So then the gentleman next to you <coughs> on the aisle there. Thank you. We'll take three at once. So um, I have like three mini questions, but I'll try and be really quick. Um, so the first one is, um, to what extent do you think that we can actually be alone in the sense of solitude that you're talking about in the philosophical sense? So alone with our thoughts in this day and age, with all the social media that we're surrounded with, with all the information that's constantly thrown at us. We have information overload everywhere we go. Um, and so to what extent, because I know I find it difficult, do you think that you can actually just be alone with your thoughts um, without overthinking about work or what's coming up on your Instagram or anything like that. Um, the second thing that I was going to ask was um, loneliness, I mean, is it, is it more of a psychological phenomenon rather than a physical phenomenon? So is it something that although you might be surrounded by family and friends, you might have the 400 friends on Facebook or whatever, um, if you feel like you can't trust someone or confide in someone or there's no one there for you when you need support, um, to what extent is that actually loneliness? And is that paradoxically then something that actually only the individual can overcome? Because you might have people willing to support you, but you might not trust them. Right. And the third thing, very quickly, oh. sorry, is no, if there's... Two questions. Okay, okay that's fine. I'm going to come back to you for a bit dry, but I suspect we won't... Hi, um, my name is Francois. Uh, pro probably I'm coming from a more psychological point of view, but um, do you think uh, life, uh, human life, is uh, expected to have uh, some periods, some periods of loneliness? Uh, I'm saying we all have social lives, and but I think we have 
to experience as humans some periods in our lives where we are lonely. It doesn't mean your whole life, but maybe two years or... And, and I think we, we, don't, we don't get, <laughs> or, or probably a few months, I don't know. Yeah. But we don't get to appreciate, or we, we, don't, we don't get from the media a message saying it's good to be alone. You should be some time in your life on your own. Okay, great. And then there was one in the aisle left. Hello there. Uh, my name's Thomas, and I wanted to ask a question based on what are your propositions. So it's open to the whole panel, and without much pressure on your individual answers, what solutions can your knowledge in history, humanity, and of writing offer to us <coughs> as the future makers and professionals of the society? Can you say that last I'm again? sorry, I didn't catch yeah, that. Just the last bit again. I'll say it again. So what solutions can your knowledge in history, humanities, and writing offer to us as the future makers and professionals in the sense of solutions to the problem of loneliness? The problem of loneliness. Okay, great. So we had, um, to what extent can we be alone in the social media age? Is it a psychological phenomena? We had, is a loneliness or a period of solitude necessary to human life? And what are your solutions to the problem of loneliness? Any takers? I think the first question is, sure, you can be alone. You know, just delete your account. I mean, yeah. it's really straightforward. <laughs> Don't turn um, it on. Just turn it off. I mean, we, become, a, we, do become, yeah, we do become addicted <laughs> to it. There's a kind of Pavlovian response when you get a ping and a notification comes up. Just get rid of it. I mean, if, if it's bothering you enough, just turn it off, delete it, move away. And people have done it, and, you know, uh, they seem okay. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm very confident. Well, I, I think you could. I mean, it's like taking yourself off to a cabin in the woods. Just, just hit delete. It's fine. I mean, <coughs> you're going to lose something, though. That's, that's the thing. So it's a trade-off always, and I think that's why we're getting this notion that there's a kind of value to intermittent periods of, of degrees of removing yourself from the noise that other people produce. But it's always nice to be able to return on your own terms. I think some, one of the problems is it's often difficult to be able to dictate how lonely you can be and when. Look, I'm a parent. I mean, it's, you get grief all the time just when you don't need it. Um, and sometimes I really want them to be around and they're not. Um, and so th there is that... It's the question of control over your degree of being and being without other people, I think, that often causes the problem, rather than the particular states themselves. So that, that was my first thought there. Did you ask a question? Uh, I, think I, I think your second question was one about a sense of lack of support, that you might have people trust. around you, and but mm. you, that you didn't necessarily trust them, or you couldn't. Because I think, I mean, I, and you were asking about solutions. Um, and is loneliness a, an integral part of life? And I, 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 I don't know. I mean, speaking as someone who teaching in a university, um, I do want to hook this up to something which I think um, anyone teaching, um, probably in, in throughout the whole of the educational system, is experiencing right now, which is incredibly high levels of psychological distress um, among young people. Mm -hmm. And um, a sense of um, uh, you know un the, the pressures that young people are experiencing, um, you know, in a, in a hyper competitive world, very insecure, very difficult to be able to imagine a, a future where you really know what sort of job you might have, what might offer you satisfaction, will you be able to ever have a home of your own, all the conditions of having a family life, are they going to be available to you? You know, um, I mean, there's pressures coming from all directions, and our students are forced into, the, you know, a competitive environment quite unlike anything of my generation had to experience. Uh, so I, I think, I do think that all those things mean that forming kind of, you know, social connections that feel strong enough to hold one um, is becoming increasingly difficult. Um, and, uh, and I think that some of the popularity of social media is that it's answering a kind of 
sense of, 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 of need around being able to connect up when you're not quite connected up. I mean, that is, you're, you don't have time to meet people up, to form ongoing attachments in which, you know, with a kind of reciprocity. I'm not saying people don't form friendships anymore. I'm not trying to go overboard on this. Of course they do. But I, I, I just want to emphasize, I think, you know, we're, we're, we're in a, such a difficult time, especially not exclusively for younger people, but, uh, but I'm thinking of those particularly as a teacher. Um, and so, and I'm quite sure that this is giving rise to feelings of isolation and insecurity, uh, which, are, which, are, which, are, which are really dreadful, really soul-destroying right now. Um, and, um, and so the answer, I think, I'm afraid, I think that the solution, and maybe echoing some of the things that John has said, needs to be a collective solution. I think, you know, I mean, there's a slogan going around, time's up. And um, it seems to me that, um, that right now, you know, young people, I mean, part of it being so, so siloed in one's own life that it's actually hard to think ahead to what people might do together to change this. But I think it is a bitter irony that, you know, governments right now and so on are making a lot of noise about loneliness and setting up you know, commissions and uh, having ministers for loneliness when the conditions that breed isolation and loneliness are ones that Western governments seem to be in the business of fomenting. Um, so, you know, I think there is a real, I think there's a politics of loneliness that needs to be thought about here, and I think it's not a very comfortable one for um, existing uh, power relations in our society, actually. John? You just used the word that we've, we've managed to skip all the way through until now, isolation, which of course is a different thing again. Um, you know, when, when um, uh, John Dunn says, no man is an island in power of itself, every man is a piece of the continent, etc. Sorry for the gendered language. But that's, that's, the, that's that thing, that, that sense of isolation, to be, to be, to be an island, as it were, unwi unwillingly. I, I, I think, I didn't hear your name, the gentleman that asked the second question. Um, at times in our lives, it makes absolute sense to be alone. It makes absolute sense to be alone, to figure things out, to we go on retreats. We decide how long they should be and how short they should be, if we have any kind of power over that. And I think it's absolutely wonderful that any society should offer that. We don't get enough of it, by any means. Um, and there are societies in the or the worst societies in the East, less so now, that allow people to take a year out and, and live a contemplative life for a year and then enrich them going back into the society to work together with um, others. Um, and there are times when you need to be right in the thick of things, working together with other people. Um, but again, is it, what is working together with other people now? What does that mean? Um, I like the, the idea that no man is an island because and it, it's quite simply true. As you say, no man, uh, if a man is an island or a person is an island long enough, they, they, they die, they fragment, and they wash away. But if they never get to be alone, then they just, they just become part of an amorphous mass. And what I worry about is I see people all the time plugged in all the time. You know, with my sons do it. I, I, I talked to my son for about 10 minutes the other day, and I realized he didn't hear a word he'd said, because he had these little tiny implants in his ears. Which meant he was listening to something in Ukraine or someplace while he was just nodding to me. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to hear what I say. So he's got this stuff stuck in his ears. But I, I have one solution to offer to the gentleman over there. Um, and I'm not being flippant about this. Is that, not because I write poetry myself. Read. That's one piece of advice. Read books. Another one is read poetry. You know, one of the greatest poets who ever lived said, um, what po poets do, what poetry does, is to look at the other, to look at the other and make connection with the other as if that other were a subject, because they are, a subject like oneself. Now, the thing about connectivity is we all keep saying, oh, we're lacking connectivity, we're, we're, we're disconnected, etc. It's up to us to make the connections if we feel the lack of connectivity.
And we don't have to, that doesn't mean we have to go and join the, the local karate club or the women's union, or the mother's union, or what it's called. It means we can connect in other ways. And one of them is just simply re reading a poem. To read a poem and to see the way in which a person who's 200 years dead looked at a certain tree or thought about the absence of their husband or drank a glass of wine underneath the moon thinking of a, a good friend, to, to enter into the subjectivity of another while they try and understand the subjectivity of, of something other to them. It's a wonderful thing. We should all be reading poetry till it's coming out of our ears. And yet every... Yeah, I would say that because I write poetry. But every year we lose more and more poetry readers. And yet, strangely, a lot more people are writing poetry. Why is that? You know... Why do you write poetry if you don't bother to read it? Why would anybody read your poems if you don't read anybody else's poems? Let's get some more... Um, I wanted to come back to... Yeah. It is quite an urgent question. Mm. OK, so what are we going to yeah. do about it? Well, particularly the way Barbara's put it, that there are the, the structural conditions of isolation which may not, may not be to do with us, may not do with volition, and poetry might not be the thing to right. be to help so, us. I mean, it, it isn't something we, you know, each individual can solve on their own. You don't wake up one day and say, oh, gosh, I'm lonely, I'll sort that. Um, uh, it, it is true that young people apparently are reporting high levels mm -hmm. of loneliness. It's, of course, the elderly, too, who, mm -hmm. are, who, are, who are marked by this, I think. Um, I had a quick look at the Joe Cox Commission report. I don't know whether other people have done that. It's, it's very bright and breezy, at least the summary one that I saw. And what struck me was I, I began to wonder whether loneliness is being used as a kind of umbrella to cover all sorts of different mm -hmm things actually that are going on. It's not just a kind of feeling. It's, it's a sense of um, there are people who aren't engaged in some way, or there are people who feel they've been left behind, or there are people who feel they can't access various kinds of things that they should be able to. There are people who would like to read a poem but just physically can't get out of the house to go to the library or can't get the broadband in or their the library village or, closed down. or whatever. Or exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, so there are, I think it's going to be a piecemeal approach if we're going to approach it. There's not a single essence of loneliness that we're going to grasp and suddenly we'll work out what the recipe is to that. When we're doing that, I think, though, we have to be careful. One of the things that alarmed me a bit as I read the report was one of the things they'd done was go on a door-knocking exercise in a neighbourhood, yeah. <laughs> in part just to kind of record levels of social exclusion and isolation you know have has anyone talked to you this week or have you had a phone call today and so on but there's a there's a degree to which that might reintroduce a sense of surveillance and a sense of various kinds of requirements and norms that we've struggled to kind of throw off uh, actually and we perhaps wouldn't want to reintroduce all of those in in the name of uh, of, of, of combating uh, a kind of psychological label. Thank you. Let's get some three more questions. One at the very front and then a person behind you and one more over there. So these three. Thank you very much. There's this thing that John mentioned that we need to go away to find ourselves. I feel that's really absurd because being part of a society or living in a society, we can only find ourselves in the society as opposed to going away. What do you think? behind you with a grey cardigan, thank you. Hi, yeah. This is more about um, how productive it can be, you know, to philosophise alone. So, Sorry, could you, s could you slow down a little bit? Sorry. So this is more about um, how productive it can be to philosophise alone. So I feel that in contemporary philosophy, we're really encouraged to deliberate, to articulate our thoughts, and especially with others. Um, you know, we can get more clarity in that sense or someone else can, you know, um, correct us. And that when we just think alone all the time, we're more prone to illusion, more prone to false thoughts, but then I wonder how, you know, famous ivory tower philosophers managed to get these truths about the society that still resonate with us today, you know, by completely excluding themselves from their society and sometimes how blind they were. So, um, yeah, I guess, does it depend maybe on different types of generations of philosophers? Is it more popular today or does it maybe depend on how rational you're able to be um, by yourself or, yeah? Great. And there was a question over here. Thank you. Um, I'd just be interested in your view on how solitude can be used as a punishment. Um, and ultimately, it's 
inflicting pain on people and the deprivation of those human relationships, or whether, in fact, it could be seen as a rehabilitative tool in that you are going to a higher existence and this kind of enforced contemplation, whether it be through imprisonment or whatever, um, could actually lead to a um, better individual in society. Okay, so that was one about going away to find ourselves. A philosophical question about, I think it was sort of about, about peer review. How, <laughs> how productive is it to be with others and how do we think alone and how good is our thinking alone um, when we could be with other academics? And the third one was about solitude as a punishment or as a rehabilitative tool. Can I just start with the last one just very quickly because yeah. it's very interesting that you pitched it like that because when solitary confinement was first proposed in this country, it was precisely as a rehabilitative tool. I mean, the, it, this is the late 18th century and the prisons were pretty mm -hmm. ghastly places, where, you know. So the idea was that instead of punishing people in all these sort of grotesque ways that you know, people tend to be punished in prisons, you would simply put them on their own where they could think about, I mean, and you would have you know, a Bible you know, and so on and so forth, and they would be able to think about, you know, do penance, think about their sins, think about God, and undergo moral reformation. And so this was seen to be a very you know, uh, re reforming, real reforming. Uh, of course, the moment that they actually introduced solitary confinement into the prisons, Everybody started going crazy, and they still do, although it's used very, very widely today. Um, and prison inspectors started saying, well, actually, this is a nightmare. Um, and, there was a, and they pulled back from it to a degree. And the fact that now solitary confinement is of a scale that has never been seen before. Uh, this country is bad. The United States is off the scale. Um, you know, but no one talks about it as rehabilitative anymore. It's just control. So that is terribly interesting. Any other takers for the questions? Maybe? Yeah, I mean, maybe the the kind of uh, the the genius philosopher who just sits in a room and writes a great work. Um, I think that's a bit of a myth, really. I'm not convinced there ever really were such people, I mean I've, no, I've not met many of these, I don't think I've ever met any of these and I think it's a myth that we tell about philosophers <laughs> to explain why they're different but they're not that different actually, really, they just think about different kinds of questions I mean, some of them are weird but there are all sorts of weird people doing all sorts of different <laughs> things but that's not because they're philosophers, they might be philosophers because they're weird <laughs> I don't know if that was an answer, or, but I'll take it. Um, Can I just jump in on the, yeah, of course, the, the thing about, of course, using solitude in the prison as a punishment is that, of course, there's no way for it to be rehabilitative, rehabilitative because um, you're still inside a prison. You're still... Solitude is not of your own choosing. Mm -hmm. And the other really important thing is, as anybody who's been in prison knows, it's extremely noisy in prison. It never stops. It's noisy all day and it's noisy all yeah. night. So, of course, you don't get any. Even in, if you're in solitary, you still hear all of the noise. So, but the other part of it is about going away to find yourself. I don't believe you go into solitude to find yourself. I think the self is rather overrated. Um, you know, and maybe one of the problems we have in our society is we're constantly thinking about self. Uh, I think we go into solitude um, when we do it voluntarily, and when we choose, for example, um, what might be seen as, for, for some people at least, as um, a, a decent solitude, a solitude, in, a thorough vegan solitude, if you like, is to find something else, is to make the connection to, and I, again, it could be God, it could be <coughs> angels, it could be nature, it could be, I think in most cases, using the word, the words are usually nonsense words. You know, um, God, nature, these are all nonsense words. It's something else. It's, you know, the Chinese um, philosophers understood exactly that the first rule should be, if you can name it, you're not talking about it. Because if you can name it, you've only got a diminished version of it. If you can describe it, definitely you're not talking about it. The Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao. You can experience it, but you can't describe it, you can't name it, you can't categorize it. You can only experience it. But as Lao Tse says, um, you can see it everywhere around you. You can see its workings in nature. 
whatever it is, the way, whatever. You can see it all around you. And if you go alone, outside the societal, and maybe it wasn't necessary for the Greeks because they didn't have you know, a power plant next to them on one side and a car factory on the other. No, but I think it smelt very bad. Probably smelled bad, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, if you can get outside the spell and have a kind of contemplative life, I think you begin to see that. Whatever that is, you see it working. And you see that it works everywhere. I mean, I think we have to do a big push for Albertus Magnus and bring him back to, to a position. He's much more interested than Aquinas, for example. Um, you can see it. He says you can see it, see it everywhere. And there's so much um, overlap between um, Eastern philosophy about this subject, about what nature, etc., and Western philosophy, which we thought, when I was a student in the 70s, we thought that Eastern philosophy was coming with a whole new branch of new ideas that Westerners never thought of before to rescue us. And then you start to see that those people had been suppressed in our tradition pretty much. But I don't think you look for yourself. I don't think you go out to look for yourself. I, I find myself rather boring. But I find <laughs> the natural world, or the world around me, infinitely fascinating. I feel like we're going to find John in an ashram next week somewhere in the Himalayas. We've run out of time. We've got about a minute, so I'm going to improvise and say, ask you one last question, a short one. If you were to go away and find yourselves, what would you find? <laughs> That's what I want to know. <laughs> when you're alone, who are you with? An empty fridge. In my, in my <laughs> James? Uh, I don't really understand the question. <laughs> if I'm alone, I'm not with anyone. He is a philosopher. You know. Philosophers. <laughs> Barbara? Um, I think, I, I mean, I, it, it, that is, it, it's a question that has so many answers, and some of them are very simplistic and tedious and others are interesting and I think if we were to try and get into the interesting answers we would be here for many more hours so you know I, I, it's a question that I've uh, many people I, I, I suspect it would be very interesting if we could keep people here a little longer and ask them this question who are you with when you're alone it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful I, maybe that's the what do they say the takeaway the takeaway that you could have from this is <laughs> ask yourself that question uh, we have run out of time thank you for being wonderful company will you join me in thanking our t tremendous sociable guest today <laughs>